It seems fitting that at a time like this, we would talk about Thanksgiving. It seems fitting that at a time like this, as we approach a day set aside for giving thanks, that we would turn to the example of one who gave thanks to the Father and modeled for you and me what a perfect, flawless, sinless life looks like. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible admonishes us, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Giving thanks through Him. And so last week, Pastor Anianzi provided the first of three examples found in the New Testament of Jesus giving thanks. He gave thanks when there wasn't enough. How many of us know what that feels like? To feel inadequate, ill-prepared, unequipped. To feel like we just don't have enough and what we need is a miracle. Today, we take a look at a second example set for us by Jesus. Jesus, who set an example of giving thanks in times of sorrow. In John chapter 10, we find Jesus in Jerusalem answering the questions of the religious leaders of that day, the Pharisees, as he was teaching, they began to inquire about his authority and he declared himself to be the Son of God and took it a step further and said that he is one with the Father. This infuriated the religious leaders, as we'll see in a few minutes, and his life was threatened. The lives of those who followed him were in danger, and Jesus traveled across the Jordan River to the place where John, his second cousin, had been baptizing and calling people to repentance. It's believed that he was there when he received news that a dear friend was taken ill. And after some time, Jesus traveled to the home of this friend named Lazarus. And coming upon Lazarus' two sisters and a community mourning the loss of this very good man. Jesus did the unthinkable. When when I was a child, I heard a pastor refer to this story that's found in John chapter 11. In a funeral service, and it resonated with me and on many occasions when I've had the opportunity to celebrate the life of a follower of Jesus Christ, I too have referenced this account. The account of Jesus approaching the tomb of a dead man and doing the unthinkable. In a moment of great sorrow, the Son of God not only gave thanks, but He accomplished the impossible. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 11. As we read together from the Word of God, it is fitting that we stand to our feet. And we begin reading from John chapter 11, beginning at verse 41. So they took away the stone, then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your word, which is as real and relevant to our lives today as to those who first read these words 2,000 years ago. And the work that you are doing is as necessary in our world today as it was right there in Bethany as a community was filled with sorrow. Father, I pray that you would give us the strength to give thanks at all times, under all circumstances, even in times of sorrow, because you have something greater in store. May we trust in your unfailing love as we thank you for your grace and your goodness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. Well, this is a timely message in light of what many are walking through today, in light of the tragedies that we hear about in the news, senseless acts of violence, unexplainable atrocities, the ruthless murder of helpless defenseless, often innocent men, women, and children. We live in a fallen and broken world. And when you simply immerse yourself in the news of the tragedies of this world, the anxiety, the stress, the sorrow can raise to a boiling point. I would submit to you that there isn't a good time for sorrow. In John chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, we read that a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. People often say, this didn't come at a good time. But is there ever really a good time for sorrow? Really? There isn't a good time for sorrow. Because sorrow comes during busy times. Sorrow doesn't consult your schedule. Surely Jesus was busy. We read in John chapter 10, verse 31. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Take a pause for just a moment. For many of us who follow Jesus, we have accepted His deity and divinity. But do we recognize how abrasive, how insulting, how controversial such claims truly are? This week I was in Seattle, 
my sister's hospital room. And a member of the nursing staff came into the room and we began to talk and I asked some questions and listened to the answers and before long, conversation took a turn and it became very clear to me that this individual was a practicing and enthusiastic Muslim. I was there to express my love, my care, my compassion for my sister. Not to engage in debate or shift the climate in the room in an unhealthy way. And so I listened. I listened for about half an hour as this man explained to me that Muslims will not insult Jesus as Christians insult Mohammed. Nope. He said they won't because the Quran talks about Jesus. He said Muslims revere Jesus because Jesus, he said, is a prophet. He said Jesus is nothing more and somehow he didn't consider that an insult. Kind of like going to a grown man and saying, Wow, you are really cool for a baby. Going to a grown man and saying, Look at all that muscle, and yet you're dependent on someone else to provide for you. Compliment, right? Men, you'd take that as a compliment, wouldn't you? <laughs> to look at the Son of Almighty God who is co-equal with the Father and the Spirit and say He is a prophet like Moses? A prophet like Jeremiah? Like Mohammed? No, Jesus is not like them because Jesus not only claimed to be God, He is in fact God. Friends, I want to encourage you today that Jesus was really busy at this point in time when the sorrow came His way because... Controversy had stirred up around him. We are told in John chapter 10, verse 40, that Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, Many believed in Jesus. He was busy doing the very work for which he, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but took on human form to be the Savior of the world. You see, Jesus was no mere prophet. Jesus was the only one who could set men and women and children free from the bondage of sin and death. And Jesus was very busy providing a path to eternal life. Doing the ministry that needed to be accomplished. Not only does sorrow come during busy times, but sorrow causes priorities to adjust. You notice the word adjustment there. In John chapter 11, beginning at verse 5, we read, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So he heard that Lazarus was sick. He stayed there where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. I find this intriguing. 
The fact that Jesus didn't drop everything. The fact that he didn't abandon the masses who have just put their faith in him, but rather he stayed for two days to make sure that they were equipped for the next steps because Jesus is all about sharing life's journey. And even though his heart was grieved, even though his disciples were concerned, even though Mary and Martha were desperate for Jesus to come, Jesus stayed there for two more days and adjusted his priorities. He didn't drop his priorities. He didn't shirk his responsibility. He simply made the necessary adjustments so that he could go where he needed to be next. I want you to picture for a moment the world in which this story takes place. In Israel, Jesus had been ministering in Jerusalem when he infuriated the religious leaders. When they picked up the stones to stone him, Jesus was in Jerusalem and the Bible tells us that he left Jerusalem and he crossed over to the eastern side of the Jordan. This was about a day's journey. Now scholars believe that one of the most likely places where Jesus may have gone would have been about six miles north of the Dead Sea along the eastern side of the Jordan River. A day's journey from Jerusalem. If this were the case, then when Mary and Martha sent a message to Jesus, it would have taken a day on foot for the messenger to reach Jesus. If it took a day for the messenger to reach Jesus and Lazarus was near death when the messenger left Bethany, it's possible that Lazarus may have died within moments of the messenger's departure. So even by the time the message that Lazarus was sick arrived to Jesus east of the Jordan River, he had been dead for a day. Jesus then remained two more days before he told his disciples it was time to go. And if this is in fact the location where Jesus had been ministering and pouring into those who were now following Him, it would have taken Him another day to get to Bethany on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem, making it four days that Lazarus had been dead when Jesus arrived there. You see, Jesus had to adjust his priorities and often adjusting priorities doesn't occur instantly because sorrow does not occur in a vacuum. The world doesn't stop spinning because of our sorrow. In John chapter 11, verse 8, we read, But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you are going back? Hey, hey, wait a minute, Jesus. We understand that Lazarus is sick. We get that your heart is grieved. But do you remember how dangerous it is? Do you really think that four or five days is enough time? You want to go back? No, sorrow doesn't occur in a vacuum. The circumstances of our lives keep swirling in the midst of the challenges that we face. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, we read, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Many times as I've read this passage of Scripture, I've pictured these times separate from each other. 
But the reality is that in the real world, there's overlap. There's overlap between birth and death. Sometimes we celebrate a new family member as we say goodbye to another. Many times, the old is torn out just as the new is being placed into the ground. Many times, there's pain in the midst of healing. Many times, demolition is required in order for new construction or remodeling to occur. Many times, we receive devastating news when we should be experiencing joy. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Sometimes they happen simultaneously. Often we think of, of, of that phrase like a lover's embrace. But the word embrace in the Hebrew, chavak, it, it's the clasping of hands, the holding together. Many times we let go of something as we grab hold of something else. Yes, sorrow doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs as life is going on. I remember a couple of years ago when our family moved here to Lodi and we began to meet with the church board and get to know this church family and talk about some of the things that God has in store and some of the things that need to occur and some of the things that were identified long before we ever arrived still need to occur. There have been occasions when I thought it would be great if we could just hit the pause button, fix everything, and then hit play again. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Wouldn't that be great in your life? Like every day? Hit the pause button, get everything set just right, and hit play again. But life doesn't happen that way. No, life just barrels on, moves forward. pastor of Saddleback Church, author of Purpose Driven Life, Pastor Rick Warren, put it this way. He said, rather than life being hills and valleys, I believe that it's kind of like two rails on a railroad track. And at all times, you have something good and something bad in your life. No matter how good things are in your life, there is always something bad that needs to be worked on. And no matter how bad things are in your life, there is always something good you can be thankful for. You see, Jesus had some good things going on near the Jordan River as something bad was happening in Bethany. And Jesus postponed his trip to Bethany for good reason, and yet Lazarus had died by the time Jesus arrived. And there was great sorrow, but I believe that in the example of Jesus, we see an example of sorrow without regret. In John chapter 11, verses 11 through 15, we read, After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Sorrow without regret, Jesus had no regret about the fact that he was not there at the moment of Lazarus' passing, or that he didn't get to talk to Lazarus one more time before he died. No regret at all. And even as Jesus is describing the reality of the circumstances that are taking place in Bethany, his disciples misunderstood what was going on. Jesus said that he's asleep, and the disciples think, hey, if he's asleep, he'll get better. That's a good thing. They misunderstood. How many of you know that sorrow can bring misunderstanding? Sorrow can bring misunderstanding. In fact, Thomas misunderstood why they were going to see Lazarus when Jesus said, let's go to him. 
Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Say what? Now, how many of you remember that Thomas is the one who had to touch the nail scars in Jesus' hands and where the spear had pierced his side? And we call him Doubting Thomas. And many times Thomas gets a pretty bad rap, but can I just say, there are some things we bring on ourselves. Here's Thomas. Jesus is like, let's go to him. And Thomas says to everybody, let's also go that we may die with him. Why? You, you think that Thomas thinks they're going to get sick? No. I believe Thomas is visualizing the stones flying at them as they approach Jerusalem. It's only been a few days. If we go there, it's over for us. But hey, we'll get to see Lazarus again. Sorrow can bring misunderstanding. In fact, sometimes in moments of sorrow, as we grieve the loss of someone or something important to us, we may want to die ourselves because we don't understand what God is doing in times of sorrow. Martha misunderstood about Lazarus being raised from the dead immediately. In John 11, beginning at verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. Oh no. Jesus meant right now. The crowd misunderstood why Jesus wept. We read in John 11 verse 35, the, the shortest verse in the English translation of the Bible, Jesus wept. Verse 36 continues, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? They didn't understand that there was a reason that Jesus needed to stay east of the Jordan. That there was a reason that Lazarus needed to not only die, but remain in the grave to a point when there was no hope for his resurrection. When nobody could say, we made a mistake. He was just in a deep sleep. His heart has simply slowed down. No, no, he stinks. His body's decaying. There's no chance. And the crowd misunderstood why Jesus was weeping. I don't believe for a moment that Jesus wept because he was sad at the loss of Lazarus. I don't think for a second that Jesus wept because he felt like Lazarus missed out on how this season of Survivor was going to end or that Lazarus wasn't going to get to see episode 8 of Star Wars coming out in December. I don't think he was sad that they weren't going to get to hang out and enjoy a meal together. I don't think that's why Jesus wept at all. I believe Jesus wept For an eternal reason. Because he saw the pain and the suffering around him. That he came to heal and to deliver. And that now he would call back one who had entered eternity into this world filled with sorrow. Now the crowd didn't understand. And again, Martha misunderstood why Jesus wanted the stone to be moved. Perhaps thinking that He wanted to view the body of His friend. Take away the stone, He said in John eleven thirty nine. 39. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for He has been there for days. She wanted to leave the stone that would prevent the miracle that God had in store because she didn't believe. She didn't know. She didn't understand 
that God had something so great in store that could only be revealed when that stone was moved out of the way. They all misunderstood that God's glory shines through sorrow. In John 11.40, Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Jeremiah 31 describes what happens when God gloriously delivers His people from oppressors that are stronger than they. We read in the latter part of Jeremiah 31, 13, I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. Yes, God's glory shines through Sorrow. Sorrow does not change the truth. Jesus didn't wait to see results before giving thanks. Jesus gave thanks for the opportunity to be heard by the Father with an expectation of the results that were yet to come. We read in John eleven forty one, 41, So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. The very thing that incited the religious leaders of his day to throw stones at him is about to be revealed that he is sent by the Father with the full power and authority of heaven. And he gives thanks. He gives thanks before the miracle occurs in the midst of the sorrow because he knows the truth. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I would submit to you that Lazarus was not raised from the dead for his benefit, but Lazarus was raised from the dead for our benefit. that they may believe. That evidence may be given of His awesome power. That those who lived with Him and walked with Him would see a foreshadow of what He would do for Himself through His own power and what awaits every Man, woman, and child who follows the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. The King of kings and Lord of lords. The healer. The way. The truth. And the life. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that whatever sorrow you may be experiencing now, whatever pain you have walked through, whatever challenges await you, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and that He can show the glory of God through the darkest of days in the most dire circumstances? If you do, then I believe the example that Jesus set for you and me which is so much easier to preach 
than it is to practice. It's to give thanks in times of sorrow. To give thanks when the timing doesn't seem right. To give thanks when your heart aches for things to be different. Give thanks when you hope for a miracle that hasn't occurred yet. Give thanks when God can reveal His glory. To give thanks in times of sorrow is one of the most challenging expressions of our faith and our total dependence in Jesus Christ. Two days ago, I received a phone call from my friend B. Hill. He's here with us this morning. And I asked for her permission to share what we discussed in that phone call. She graciously granted me that permission. You see, many of you remember a few weeks ago when B stood right here and declared that she had been healed of leukemia. That that six month time frame that had been set in the spring of this year no longer had a grip on her. That God's healing power was at work in her body. And many of you know that even since she shared that true testimony of God's healing power, B has received devastating news. Many of you have been praying over the last week for me knowing that the leukemia has returned, metastasized in her skin, that tomorrow she'll be un undergoing treatment once again. It's hard to give thanks at a time like this. I would reveal to you how big a hypocrite I really am if I told you that it was easy to give thanks in times of sorrow. It isn't easy. Because the, the timing doesn't seem right. I mean, it would have been good to have a year or two to just kind of bask in the healing power of God. We have another dear one in our church who's preparing to enter eternity any moment. This isn't a good time. Many of us are facing challenges in our family. Loved ones who are sick and suffering. Some are facing transitions at work. And the holidays are coming. We're supposed to sit around a table with a feast and give thanks. This really isn't a good time. And yet in times of sorrow, Jesus gave thanks. And our hearts ache for things to be different. And I know, I know, no. My sister serves a God who heals. And she trusts in God for her healing again. That's why she shared with me the other day that when she received a phone call from a friend named Scott, who has not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. that she began to give thanks to God for the opportunity to speak into Scott's life through
through her sorrow and suffering, through her sickness and disease. Because this man said he believes in God, but has never surrendered, has never received the gift of eternal life. He's never received the peace, the hope, the joy that he sees evident in B, and he's just not sure if he's ready. And then our sister did something so brave, so bold. She said, Scott, if God heals me again, would you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you choose to follow him? We spoke the other day. B asked me to pray. Not for her comfort. Not for her health but that the glory of God might be revealed through her. That this friend might receive the gift of eternal life. Friends, I want to encourage you to give thanks today when your heart aches for things to be different. To give thanks when you hope for a miracle and you haven't seen it just yet. To give thanks when God can reveal His glory once again. If you're here today and you felt pain, you felt sorrow, you felt a distance between the God of the universe and yourself. I want to encourage you to do as Jesus did and give thanks. Give thanks to the one who is the resurrection and the life. Give thanks in times of sorrow because he turns sorrow into joy.